or it could be from social insurance, like uh, the, the cases of the Western European countries, where essentially we are supposed to provide a, a free or nominally um, low-cost low cost, uh, service that's provided by government. So it has an illusion of free, but somebody got to pay for it. Either you pay from taxes or you pay it from uh, premiums, regular premiums, which is eventually become a form of tax if it is compulsory. But we know the results of a welfare state uh, system. Uh, it will lead to a lot of long queues, uh, overconsumption, but very low quality, and also the kind of uh, problems of state-run services where civil servants will not be incentivized to provide high quality and efficient service. So it will not be as responsive as, say, a market-based system which you have, say, in the other extreme. Uh, the US is a prime example where, you know, it's essentially a free market, very competitive, a fee for service. So doctors are incentivized and hospitals and providers to do more and to be responsive to consumer demands. But you end up then uh, pushing costs up and creating the moral hazard, moral hazard of an abuse, uh, the abuse of uh, services because uh, somebody got to find a means to finance it and so essentially a market would develop uh, for insurance when people cannot access or cannot have uh, uh, cannot afford to pay then uh, naturally they'll buy insurance so insurance then becomes a very natural a natural development of the free market situation but insurance has got uh, two classic uh, problems one of them is abuse because a third party pays not the first two parties between patient and doctor, but the third party, the insurance company, or, or, uh, comes in. Uh, and so you have this inbuilt inflationary uh, process that keep pushing up uh, the cost and the, and the cost of uh, premiums as well as the cost of healthcare. The other classic example is ad adverse selection, meaning that uh, precisely the people who should be covered will not be covered uh, because the private insurance companies are profit-seeking, so they will not want to exclude the old and, and those in... Uh, we have a very high risk. And those at high risk, high risk will therefore have to pay more. And again, they will select themselves out. So you end up with a classic example of uh, what we call in healthcare the inverse care law. Those who should be getting the care and not getting it, and those who don't get the care get more of it. Um, another way of looking at it is the, the inequalities, the disparities that could come out from a free market situation. Now, so Singapore says that we do not want both extremes. And we went through this, uh, uh, this process the last 20, 30 years of moving towards the middle ground or having a mixed system. So the public-private mix that we have in Singapore right now is put in, in this uh, graph here, where we not only try to optimize uh, as far as possible and segment the market according to levels of care and also between the three sectors, the public, the private, and the voluntary sector, the people sector. Now, the, re the reasoning is based on the uh, characteristics of the different types of care. For primary care, it is felt that it's generally affordable. So the market element could come in. You could have a choice of which GP you want to go to, you know. And there's a lot of uh, knowledge that the cons average consumer would have at a primary care level. Your coughs and colds, your lumps and bumps, and so on, right? You should be able to take care of yourself first and then choose your own doctor and be able to pay. But when it becomes uh, a little more specialized, where there's consumer ignorance, the patient will not have enough information to be able to choose the best doctor, then the state has to come in the, uh, in a much bigger way. So a lot of our public hospitals um, will be provided by government. So 80% of the hospital beds are now under the control of the government, where government not only controls the supply, but also uh, de determine the prices as well. But you still have a choice in Singapore because this is a, a free market environment. So those who want a little better from the basic can go to the private hospitals, and, but you have to pay for it yourself. Now, this is the difference between primary and specialist care. But what about long-term care, intermediate and long-term care for old folks, you know, the social care comp component? And again, this is where the market again fails because there's no money in it. And also because the government feels that you should not get into it because... The, the state may fail, you know, but who would be incentivized to take care of old folks because there's a lot of social component is not necessarily medical. And this is where we bring in the voluntary sector. So the NGO sector comes in to provide the, the community-based services, which is on the extreme right. 
So you see there's a big blank um, uh, for voluntary care. We don't want to have many of these old folks for social reasons to be put into hospitals and institutions. We don't want that kind of care. So we try to push them back as far as possible to remain uh, at home, to age in place, or to be supported by the family and community-based services. So that, that at least is the principle of how we try to optimise between the different levels of care. But what about financing? I think financing then becomes very complex. How do you pay for this public-private mix in health and social care? The current health and social care financing schemes are quite complex, as you can see, because we have tried to evolve from a very sim simple national health tax-based model where government is seen to be the dominant, uh, not only provider, but a dominant finance, finan uh, financing uh, agent towards a mixed system. Now, there's a lot of myth about our system. You know, you must have heard the three M's, and even Professor Tomiko can't remember them. I'm sure a lot of you won't, you know. So what are the three M's? The three M, the world seems to think that our whole healthcare system is under the three M, which is a big myth. If you really look at, after 25, 30 years now of introducing Medisafe, the three M still covers only 15% of our total healthcare expenditure. Okay? Only about 15%. About 25% still comes from government subsidies from tax, tax base. Uh, the government has deliberately tried to move from about 50% at the point of inter, uh, independence now down to 30 At one time, it was precariously down to 20%. Now, it's back to about 25%. But still very low in comparison with other developed countries. But the 3M, which was the original scheme that we evolved, which is a savings-based scheme, to wean the system away from too much dependence on government and away from uh, predominant taxation system, after 30 years, we are still absorbing only 15%. But meanwhile, the MediSafe savings, we have accumulated the equivalent of 10 years of the annual health budget. So I don't understand why we are sa over-saving so much, and, and quite proud of it, you know. <laughs> Originally, the intention, when I was in the Ministry of Health years ago, we thought we bring in the savings to take care of about one-third that the 3M was supposed to take care about one third. Another one third was supposed to be from tax uh, financing because the poor will still be with you and you need the taxes to provide public health services and to cross subsidize the poor. And then the other one third was supposed to be coming from uh, the employers, from the private sector. So we, we are supposed to have a one third, one third, one third scheme. That was like 30 years ago, but somehow along the way, we sort of like evolved into a, a monster. Right now, if you, look, if you look at this. So we have the 3M on paper, right? But in reality, with all the rules and all the limits uh, about what you can use, people have to dig deeper and deeper in their pockets, especially in the last five to 10 years when the cost of healthcare has gone up. So very quickly now, the 3M framework. In 1981, when um, uh, Senior Minister, or Emeritus Minister, Senior Minister Go Chok Tong became uh, health minister, I was in the Ministry of Health then. Uh, the concept of MediSafe, which is compulsory savings for healthcare, was first enunciated. Of course, I did some homework and I discovered there was actually the great Dr. Go King Sui, who in the 1970s came up with that brilliant idea that if you're going to save for old age, one of the inevitable things that you're going to get will be basically healthcare in old age, especially the last years of your life. So, why not save for healthcare as well as for old age? So MediSafe was actually quite a brilliant scheme, if you think about it, because we were the first country to have compulsory saving for healthcare. And I've written quite extensively about this. But to cap it all, we also have it compounded as a, a family saving scheme. In other words, you can also use it for your family members. In other words, you've got uh, uh, parents or you've got children. They're also covered. So in, in some sense, it's like a family savings or even family insurance scheme. Because we believe that the family has to start off by being responsible for its own healthcare first. Now, I don't like all this thing about Singapore uh, being uh, described as a scheme that's based on individual responsibility because that smacks so much of selfishness, you know? Individual responsibility. If you really look at the scheme, the MediSafe is actually meant for to be a family saving scheme. We are supposed to use it for our family members first. And when you exhaust it, 
Then the second part kicks in.